Thank you, Your Honor. Miss Holzer, you indicated that your law firm was representing the Arvizo family in a lawsuit against J.C. Penney, right? Correct. And that was a civil lawsuit, correct? Correct. That was a lawsuit in which the Arvizo family were seeking money from J.C. Penney, correct? Correct. And the money they were seeking was allegedly based upon personal injuries they claim they had received from J.C. Penney security guards, right? Objection, Your Honor. Leading. Overruled. You may answer. Yes. Would you please speak into the microphone to your right, if you can? That one, yeah. Yes. Thanks. The purpose of medical examinations was to determine the extent of injuries, correct? Correct. Without injuries, there would be no claim for money, right? Correct. Now, did Ms. Arvizo ever tell you that she was the victim of domestic abuse by her husband? Yes. And was it your understanding her husband's name was David? Yes. And was David also a claimant, a plaintiff, in that lawsuit? Originally. And originally was David also suing J.C. Penney for damages? Yes. And the children, Star and Gavin, were also suing for damages, true? True. Okay. Did Ms. Arvizo ever tell you that her children were abused by David, to your knowledge? Determine, abused. Did she ever use the word? She never used the word, abused. Did she say the children were mistreated by David? Yes. Okay, now, at one point in the course of your responsibilities, you were shown photographs of Janet with bruises, true? True. And who first showed you those photographs? I believe Anthony Ranieri. And was it your understanding those photographs were to be used in the lawsuit against J.C. Penney? Yes. And was it your understanding that the photographs were supposed to show injuries inflicted on Ms. Arvizo by J.C. Penney security guards? Yes. Did you ever have a chance to discuss with Janet Arvizo those photographs? Yes. And what did she tell you about those photographs while that lawsuit was going on? She told me that the bruises that were on her body were inflicted by David that night after the altercation at J.C. Penney's. And what was your response to her telling you that? Well, it scared me. Why? Well, I represent my law firm, and when a client admits to fraud, it's kind of scary. And did you say anything to Mrs. Arvizo in response? Yes, I did. What did you say to Ms. Arvizo about that? I told her that she couldn't do that, that that was wrong, and that, you know, she needed to retract that, and that she needed to speak to Mr. Rothstein about it. Did you tell her that was fraudulent? I don't know whether I used that word. I told her it was wrong, that, you can't do that. And? I was very upset. And what did she say to you in response? She said, well, don't say anything to anybody because she was at that time in a custody battle with David, and that, I, I don't know. I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Did she threaten you? Yes, she did. How? She told me that David's brother Ray is in the Mexican mafia and runs drugs between Los Angeles and Las Vegas, and that she knows where I live, because she had been to my house on several occasions, and they would come and kill me and my nine-year-old daughter. Did this terrify you? Yes. Did you ever tell anyone at the law firm about what Janet had told you? No, I did not. And why didn't you do that? Because she told me not to. Did you have any additional discussions with Janet Arvizo about these fake injuries? Well, her injuries weren't fake. She had injuries. Or, let me rephrase it. Did you ever have any further discussions with her about the fake claims against J.C. Penney? I did. I tried to get her to speak to Mr. Rothstein about it. I asked her if I could speak to Mr. Rothstein about it, because we run a clean law firm, and I really didn't feel that we should be involved in something like that. And she proceeded to call me daily and tell me she had told David, and David was raging mad, and that he was going to come after me, and that I better watch my back. How many times do you think Janet Arvizo threatened you and your daughter? I'd say about eight, nine times. Are there any other, are there any other things you haven't described that she said to you when she threatened you? She just said she was scared for me and my daughter, 
that she didn't want to see anything bad happen to us, because she considered me her dear friend. Did you consider her to be your dear friend? Not at all. I was just doing my job. At some point did you learn that Janet Arvizo and her family obtained approximately $152,000 from that lawsuit? Yes. And was it your understanding that that money was distributed to various members of the family? Yes. And at some point, did you stop representing Janet Arvizo, you, being the firm? No. At some point, did the lawsuit end? Yes. And did your responsibilities as far as the Arvizos go end at some point? Once I made the blocked miners' accounts with the bank. And what do you mean by that? Well, it's my responsibility to. When a child under the age of 18 gets a settlement, it's my duties to purchase certificates of deposit at the bank so that they roll over until they're 18. Did Janet Arvizo ever talk to you about Michael Jackson? Oh, yes. What did she say about him? She would invite me and my daughter to come with them, and how wonderful he was, and what a great time my daughter would have at his ranch. Did you ever accept her invitation? No. Did Janet Arvizo ever tell you anything about her children being in acting classes? Yes. What did she say? She told me she had them in comedy, stand-up comedy classes and acting classes. I don't know how far in detail you want me to go. I do. All the way? I'll object to the narrative form of the answer. Sustained. What did Janet Arvizo tell you about her children learning to act? She said she wanted them to become good actors so she could tell them what to say and how to behave. Did she ever say anything to you about Gavin getting his stories straight in the J.C. Penney case? Yes. What did she say? She said she wasn't worried. This was at the independent medical examination for psychiatric of all three, Gavin, Starr and Janet. And when we were at the doctor's office, she was very concerned about them completing general forms, you know, like. Generally do you feel happy? Generally do you feel sad? You know, what kind of days? How do you feel when you wake up? Those kind of forms. And she refused to have the children fill them out. And then she wanted to participate in the medical examinations with the doctor and the children. And I asked her, you know, I said, you know, it doesn't work that way. You know, the doctor sees the children on their own. You know, you can't go in there. And she said, well, I'm pretty sure Gavin will get the story straight, but I'm not sure Star will remember what we practiced and what I told him to say. Now, at any point in time, did Janet Arvizo ever tell you words to the effect, call up J.C. Penny or their lawyers and tell them I lied under oath? Never. At any time did Janet Arvizo ever tell you words to the effect, call up J.C. Penny or their lawyers and give the money back? No. Did Janet Arvizo ever tell you words to the effect, let the other side know I perjured myself. No. I have no further questions. Cross? Thank you. Ms. Holzer, during the time that you were working at this law firm and this case was in your office, you had an opportunity to be able to have numerous conversations with Ms. Arvizo and other members of her family, is that correct? That is correct. And your file became extensive at your law firm, is that right? Yes, sir. All right. And it included a lot of the information about the incident and depositions and police reports and medical reports, is that correct? Correct. In fact, the Arvizos never got anything close to $152,000, did they? Objection. Foundation. Overruled. Is that true? You may answer. Okay. Well, I believe that was the gross settlement. And from that settlement was spent all the expenses, was paid for the expenses, is that correct? Some of it was expenses. There was attorney fees. There was expert fees. Yes. The children received a portion. Yes. And David rejected any portion. And, you know, he had dropped out of the case, so. David Arvizo was paid nothing? Paid nothing. Are you certain? Yes. Okay. Janet Arvizo got about $32,000, is that right? I would say that's about right. All right. Gavin Arvizo got about what, $28,000? I think $25,000 maybe. Okay. 
25. That went into an account and will stay there until he's 18? Correct. Star Arviso got about 5,000, 6,000? I think it was 8. About $8,000? Yeah. That was because of a concussion that he had, is that right? Correct. Gavin's injury was a broken elbow, fractured elbow, is that correct? Correct. And that is an injury that he received at that particular event, is that right? Objection. Foundation. Sustained. Well, your law firm certainly represented that that was an injury that was received in the J.C. Penney's event? That's what we were told at the time. And that was the basis of the injury, is that correct? That's what we were told at the time. And in fact, did he have a broken elbow? Correct. Did Janet ever tell you that David broke that elbow? Janet told me that David pushed Gavin and Star away from her when they tried to protect her. All right. As he was beating Janet that evening. All right. But do you remember telling us in an interview at your attorney's office? Yes. That Janet did not tell you? No. That Gavin, hold on, that Gavin's injury was caused by her husband? No, she did not tell me that. At any time? At any time. All right, so you're telling us that at some later time she told you that her injuries were caused by her husband? Correct. Now, among the information that you had in your law firm was the information about the arrest and release of both David and Janet Arviso from county jail, is that right? Could you repeat that, please? At the time of their arrest on that date, back in 1998, and I believe this was on August 27, 1998, the date of the incident at J.C. Penney's, both of them were arrested and taken to jail, is that right? Correct. All right. Janet was released a few hours before David, and David was released just after midnight, is that correct? That sounds correct. All right. Janet checked into the ER room about an hour and ten minutes later after David's release, is that right? Not to my knowledge. Objection. Foundation. Sustained. You have medical records from that, don't you? Well, yeah, but I haven't looked at them in years. All right, I understand that, but it is true that Janet went to the ER room that night after her release and after the release of her husband? Objection. Foundation. Sustained. Are you familiar, are you aware of whether or not she sought medical treatment that night? Objection. No, I believe she sought medical treatment the next day. Would the next day be after midnight? I guess so. Objection. Argumentative. Overruled. You don't know how long it was. I don't know the hour. All right, but do you know how much time went by from the time of David's release to the time that she checked herself into a clinic? No, I do not. If you were to learn it was in only an hour, would that be consistent with her statement to you that it was David who beat her up and caused those injuries? Well, no, maybe, I don't know. All right. Did she tell you, in fact, during this conversation where she revealed to you that it was her husband who inflicted those injuries, did she tell you that the children were there? Yes. All right. Now, you know that the children, in fact, were taken from J.C. Penney's by their grandparents? Objection. Foundation. Sustained. Do you know how the children left J.C. Penney's? No, I do not. You know that the children were at J.C. Penney's at the time of this incident? Yes, they were. And in fact, they were two of the complainants, two of the plaintiffs in this lawsuit? Correct. Both of them were injured, is that correct? Correct. All right, and that was the cause of action for a settlement of this case, is that right? Correct. Now, did you ever ask her how the children left J.C. Penney's given the fact that she and her husband were arrested? No, I did not. Did you ever ask her how these children came back into her possession in time for her to be beaten in their presence? Objection. Foundation. I asked if she asked. Relevance. The objections overruled. You may answer. Did you ever? No. Did she tell you that she went home and picked up the children first? She told me that when they got, she said when they got home, these were her words. When they got home, 
David was raging mad and accused her of creating the chaos at J.C. Penney's and Tower Records. Which home are we talking about? I'm not sure. Did she have more than one residence she stayed at at the time? Well, they lived someplace prior to where they lived later in the case. All right. This was not the Soto Street address? I don't believe so. All right. But they had a separate residence at the time? Well, they lived somewhere. But do you know if they went to the grandparents' residence in El Monte? I don't believe so, no. They were living on their own, because they had a neighbor that you had to call because they didn't have a telephone. All right. Now, these children were small at the time, weren't they? Star's pretty hefty. He's, he was a... Let me ask that question. I meant young. They were young? They were young, yeah. They were seven and eight, weren't they? Yeah. Now, seven and eight-year-olds taken away from J.C. Penney's would have been taken from J.C. Penney's by some adult, is that right? Objection. Calls for speculation and no foundation. Foundation. Sustained. All right. Well, your understanding is that an adult came and picked them up while their parents went to jail? I have no understanding. I have no understanding of any of that. Do you know how they joined up with their children that night in the period of time from the time of the release of David Arvizo from jail to the time that she checked herself into a clinic? No, I do not. But she told you that the children were present when David went into a rage, is that right? Correct. So she ended up back in the presence of both of the children? Correct. And then David got angry and inflicted injuries? Correct. Now, you've seen the photographs of her injuries, haven't you? Yes. All right. They were photographs that were furnished to your law firm at some time later, is that right? Correct. And your law firm did not become involved in this case until after the criminal matter had long been dismissed, is that true? Correct. So there was no pending criminal matter at all by the time she became involved in your law firm and this suit started, is that right? That is correct. Isn't it true that in those injuries that were shown to you, those injuries on those photographs, they go from the bottom of each leg right at the ankle, all the way up to the top of each thigh, both front and back, up to close to the buttocks on both legs? Is that true? Correct. And is it true that the injuries on her arms go all the way from the wrist, all the way to the shoulder on each arm, both front and back, is that true? That is correct. And it is true that they are rather large, substantial black and blue marks. Yes. That extend all the way from literally the wrist to the shoulder on both arms, and large, substantial black and blue marks that go all the way from the ankle to the buttocks on both legs? Is that true? That's true. In addition, there was an injury to her face, is that true? I don't recall. In addition, there was an injury to her wrist, is that right? Yes. And that would be consistent with somebody putting handcuffs on her at the time of a struggle, is that right? That's correct. In fact, all of those injuries that you saw depicted in those photographs are completely consistent with her being forced down to the ground by three or four different people who are either on top of her, using their knees to put pressure on the backs of her legs, the front of her legs, and on her arms and wrists, is that right? Objection. That's what I believe. Calls for speculation. Lack of foundation. Sustained. Did you believe, based on your observation of those injuries, that they were perfectly consistent with what you were representing in your lawsuit? At that time I did. All right. Now, did she at a later time come to you and ask you to go with her to an attorney named Michael Manning? Did he own the cigar shop? If he owned a cigar shop, yes. I don't remember his name. Do you remember telling us in an interview that she came to you and asked you to go with her to her divorce attorney? Family law lawyer? Her what? Family law lawyer. Yes. Okay. And she showed you injuries, is that right? Yes. Well, she showed them to me in my office. These were not injuries sustained in the J.C. Penney suit? This was after the case was settled. This was years and years later? Yes. All right, but you described injuries that are very consistent, in your opinion, with the injuries that she received in these photographs? They looked exactly the same. They're identical injuries? 
Pretty much, except for the handcuffs. All right. So she had bruises that were intense and huge and deep blue that went all the way from the ankle to her buttocks, the front of her leg, the back of her leg, both legs. Is that right? Yes. She had injuries that went all the way from her wrist to her shoulders, the front of her arms, the back of her arms, both arms. Is that correct? That's correct. It was identical to the injuries that you had seen three years earlier? How identical do you want me to get? They were very consistent. But they were as close as you can describe in the sense that they were consistent, large, very large, very deep, dark blue, black and blue marks, bruises. Yes. That ran, again, all the way from her ankles to her buttocks, and all the way from her wrist to her shoulders in a consistent fashion to those. Objection. Pardon me. To those photographs that you saw three years earlier, is that true? Objection. Foundation and misstates the evidence. She saw it. The objection is overruled. Do you understand the question? Is that true? That's true. Now, you then went with her to an attorney in Pasadena, is that right? Well, I first asked her to speak to Mr. Rothstein. First I asked her if I could take her to a shelter, her and the children, because she should not subject herself or her children to that. Miss Holzer, did you go with her to an attorney in Pasadena? Yes, I did. That attorney was represented to you by her as being her family law lawyer? That is correct. She was already separated from David Arvizo at that time? That is correct. And you went, and you went up into the office with her, is that right? That is correct. All right. Now, this is a person who had threatened to kill you and your child. No, she didn't threaten to kill me. She threatened to have the Mexican Mafia, her brother-in-law, kill me. But she, you believed that she was the person who was going to be instrumental in arranging the assassination of your child, is that right? That's correct. So? Well, no, she said it was her husband. Well, ma'am, did you just tell Mr. Mesero on direct, wait till the question is asked? Did you just tell Mr. Mesero on direct exam that she had threatened to have your child killed? She warned me. All right, so you're telling us now that she did not threaten to have your child killed? What she said was David is going to send his brother over to take me and my daughter out. All right, so you, you did not interpret that as meaning that she was going to? No. Arrange to have that done? Not her. She was saying that, she had told David that he had beat her that night and pushed the children out of the way when they tried to protect her. All right. Now, Mr. Mesero asked you questions about whether or not she threatened to have your child killed, and you said, yes. I guess I misunderstood. You misunderstood his question? I suppose I did. All right. Your testimony at this moment is she did not threaten to have your child killed, is that correct? What she said was, I'm worried for you and your child. I don't know what David's going to do. His brother's in the Mexican Mafia. He runs drugs between Las Vegas and Los Angeles. David is mad that I told you that he beat me that day. So this is a subsequent conversation to the first conversation that she had about. That was every conversation. She said the same thing every time. All right. And now she comes back into the office after the lawsuit with J.C. Penney's has concluded. Is that right? That's correct. You no longer have any business with Janet Arvizo whatsoever, is that right? No, that is not correct. She still hadn't done the minor's compromise. All right, so she comes back to the office and she shows you now, in the privacy of your office, all of these injuries that David had inflicted on her, is that correct? Correct. Did she tell you that she was no longer with David at that point? Yes. All right, did she tell you how it was that she, that he inflicted those injuries on her if she was no longer with him? No. Well, did you ask her that? Well, she just said, he, you know, came over, like he usually does, and beat me up again. All right, and beat her from head to toe? Head to toe, yeah. She said she'd be on the floor, and he'd be kicking her, stepping on her, kicking her, stepping on her. And you were very concerned about her well-being? Yes, I was. So you went with her to her family law lawyer, and in fact, 
You told the family law lawyer that he should do something about this, because this is a terrible situation? I did. I asked him if he was going to file a tro. All right. A tro would be a legal proceeding, a temporary restraining order, is that right? That's correct. Now, you did not feel that by doing that you would somehow activate David Arvizo's wrath and cause your child to be murdered, is that right? Well, at that point I was. I felt bad for her. I mean, I felt bad for the kids. You were no longer concerned about whether or not you and your child would be assassinated, is that true? No, I was still worried. All right, you did not call the police? No, I did not. You never called the police? No, I did not. You worked for two attorneys that you'd been working for for about 15 years, is that right? More than 20. More than 20. And you understand that between an attorney and a client, there's a confidential relationship, is that true? That's correct. And you could have gone to either one of those lawyers that you knew and say, I'm now talking to you as a client, and this is in confidence, is that right? No, I didn't want to involve my boss. You didn't want to involve your boss, the person who's prosecuting the civil suit. That's correct. Ma'am, have you returned the money yet to J.C. Penney's? No. The conversation that you had with Mr. Manning, that was his name, is that right? I don't remember his name. But he's the attorney who has an office above a cigar store. That's correct. And you sat in that office with him and with Janet Arvizo? That's correct. All right, and you had her remove enough of her clothing in your presence so that he could see those injuries, is that right? That's correct. And you told him that he should do something about those injuries, is that right? Yes, he's her family attorney. And you were pretty insistent about that, is that right? Of course. And you did that knowing that that would activate some kind of a legal action against David Arvizo? She already had a legal action against him. Did you tell Mr. Manning, or whoever that lawyer was, that you did not want to have your name included in any report? Did you tell him that? No. Did you tell him under no circumstances should he mention to the other party of that family law matter, David Arvizo, or to David Arvizo's lawyer, that you were in any way instrumental in having those injuries depicted to him? No, I was there about three minutes. You were there long enough for him to see the injuries? Yeah. And you were there long enough to give him direction as to what he should be doing on behalf of this woman, is that right? I wouldn't say give him direction. I just said, you know, what are you going to do? Are you going to file a tro? I mean, it's just common sense. Ma'am, are you taking any medications at this time? No. I have no further questions. Prosecutor Zonin ask you questions about those photographs that show injuries on Ms. Arvizo, okay? Uh-huh. Did you know that Ms. Arvizo had those photos taken a week after the J.C. Penney incident? No, I don't, because she came to our office well after the fact. Did Janet Arvizo ever show you her, oops, excuse me. Did Janet ever show you her booking photos at the jail which show no injuries? Objection. Assumes facts not in evidence and leading. Sustained. Did you ever see the booking photos at the jail which were taken when Janet Arvizo was arrested the day of the J.C. Penney events? I believe I did. She was sitting in a chair. I'm not sure. It was many years ago. I'm not sure. They don't show any injuries, do they? No. Do you recall ever asking her, when did you take the photograph that shows the injuries? That prosecutor Zonin just described? No, I never asked her. And just to clarify, how long after the J.C. Penney incident did your law firm get involved with the Arvizos, if you know? I would say nine months maybe. Okay, now, you talked about a minor's compromise, and would you please explain what that is? Well, when a minor under the age of 18 receives any form of settlement or financial gain, I believe they call it the Jimmy Coogan Law. It's to be blocked until the minor becomes 18, unless it's an annuity. And does that mean the money sits in an account and earns interest for the child until they turn 18? That's correct. Okay, and is the account in the child's name? The account is in the mother's name as legal guardian of the child. Okay, 
So to your knowledge, was that account in Janet Arvizo's name? Yes. Okay. So Janet Arvizo would have had full notice and knowledge about the existence of that account, correct? Oh, yes. She went with me to the bank. There's no question that Janet Arvizo knew about the existence of that account, correct? Yes, she knew about the existence of that account. Did you help her set up that account? Yes, I did. I filled all the paperwork out myself. And to your knowledge, was that account earning interest for Gavin? Yes. Was there also an account for Star? Yes. Did you help set that account up for Janet? Yes. And to your knowledge, was that account in Janet's name? Yes, it's Janet Arvizo as legal guardian of Gavin Arvizo, a minor. Okay, and which bank were those accounts set up at, if you know? City National Bank. Okay, now, was it part of your responsibilities at the firm to continue to gather information about those accounts after they were set up? No. To your knowledge, did the accounts then simply appear in Janet's name, right? Correct. And the statements would go to Janet, correct? Correct. And Janet would essentially take control of those accounts, right? Well, she can't touch them. She can't take the money out. But she's in charge of them, right? Yeah, she gets, the statement is in her name. Okay, okay. So approximately when do you think those accounts were set up? It was a long time before I could get her in. I really had to really get on her. As a matter of fact, the checks had expired and I had to have the checks reissued. And you set up the account for her? Right. And I had to set the accounts up again. Did she tell you where to send the statements? Yes. Do you know where they were sent? To her mother's address in El Monte. Did she tell you why she wanted them sent to that address instead of the home address? No. Did you think she was trying to hide those accounts? Objection. Speculative. Sustained. Did Janet ever tell you she had used her mother's account to funnel monies? I'll object to the term, funnel monies, argumentative. Sustained. Did Janet ever tell you about her mother's bank account? No. Did you ever know what bank her mother's accounts were at? No. Did she ever tell you about a Washington Mutual account? Gavin's donation account? Yes. Yes. I'm going to object as exceeding the scope of the cross-examination. Sustained. When did you last talk to Janet Arvizo? Objection. Exceeding the scope of the cross-examination. Overruled. You may answer. She called me, I would say, about three, four months ago. Do you know why? She wanted to be friends. What did you say? I said I was very busy. Did she say anything else? She asked me to call her. She'd like to get together and maybe have a girls' weekend. And that she had just had a baby and she was remarried. And I felt like... I'll object as to her personal feelings as irrelevant. Sustained. Did she say anything about this case at any time? No. Did she say anything about the J.C. Penney case? Well, yes, she did. I rephrase that. Yes, she did. Did she talk about the J.C. Penney case? No, she talked about this case. Did she remind you of her threats? No, she proceeded to tell me that Michael Jackson was no longer her savior. He was now the devil. Did that remind you of her calling the doctor the devil? I'll object as leading and argumentative. Sustained. Was that the first time you heard her use the word, devil? No. Did she use that word many times? I'll object as exceeding the scope of the cross-examination. Sustained. I have no further questions. I have no further questions. All right. Thank you. You may step down. Thank you. Call your next witness. Do you want to check that microphone? Is there a connection that, look at the connection. There's something causing static there. I can turn it down a little. It didn't do that before. I don't think it's the volume. I think the lawyers have beat my poor microphone to death. If you want, we can switch this one out with that one. We can switch microphones, if that's all right. Okay. Yeah, try that. To Mr. Ranieri. 
If you just stand there for a moment, we're switching microphones. No problem. Why don't you? Don't plug that in there. No? Let's leave that alone and let's have a technician look at it on the break. Take a seat. No, not yet, your honor. Test that for me. Hello, hello, hello. It's not working. Okay, that's perfect. Laughter. Let's put the other. Hello. Put the other microphone back and have a technician come over on the break, please. Okay, it's off. So make sure you turn it back on. It is the connection. We'll get some help here on the break. Hello, hello, hello. Mr. Mesero was there last. Laughter. Hello, I'm not going to touch it, your honor. Okay, no touching. Would you have the technicians come and check? Yes. Now, I'm sorry, raise your right hand. I do. Please be seated. State and spell your name for the record. My name is Anthony Ranieri. R-A-N-I-E-R-I. -E -I. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Ranieri. Good morning. Do you know someone named Janet Arvizo? I do. And when did you first meet her? My best recollection was probably in 1998. And what were the circumstances under which you met her? I was contacted by her and her family relating to a lawsuit against J.C. Penney's. And what kind of work do you do? I'm a personal injury attorney. What kind of work were you doing at that time? Personal injury trial work. And did you meet with Janet Arvizo? I did. Approximately when did you meet with her? At the same time that I got the first call. It was at a colleague's office, and I met her and two children at that time. And what did you discuss with her? Your Honor, I just want to make sure that since I have not been served with any of the orders concerning the waiver of the privilege, and it's my understanding that the privilege, as between myself and all of the family members, has been waived unconditionally, and if that's the case, I'll go ahead and proceed. Can you help me on that? I believe that was the court's order. All right, counsel, you agree? Who's on this case? That's mine, your honor, and we will agree with that. All right, I will find there is a total waiver of the confidential attorney-client privilege, and you may testify. Thank you, your honor. I'll make it different, and I'll order you to testify. Thank you, could you please repeat your question? Yes. When you first met with Janet Arvizo, what was discussed? She related to me the circumstances of the incident that formed the lawsuit against J.C. Penney's in which there was an altercation between herself, the children, her husband and J.C. Penney's security guards. And approximately when was this? The altercation or the meeting? The meeting. I believe in 1998. That's my best recollection. To your knowledge, how long after these alleged events happened did you have this meeting? Probably within a couple of weeks. That was my recollection. And did you agree to represent her? I did. Okay. Did you represent the Arvizo family in the J.C. Penney's lawsuit? I did as a member of the law firm, yes. What firm was that? Feldman and Rothstein. Okay. Do you recall attending a deposition of Janet Arvizo? Yes, I do. And in a deposition, someone testifies under oath, correct? That's correct. Someone is asked questions by the other side with a court reporter, true? That's correct. And at the beginning of the questioning, the person being deposed is told they are testifying under oath, right? That's correct. Was it your understanding that Janet Arvizo was testifying under oath, under penalty of perjury, in that deposition? It was my understanding and my instruction to her. And did she agree to abide by the oath in that deposition? I, my recollection is that in the deposition, when she was sworn by the reporter, that she understood the meaning of the oath she was taking. Do you recall in that deposition, under oath, Janet Arvizo denying that she'd ever been beaten by her husband David? I don't specifically recall that question, but I do remember in general that that was, that she always had denied that, yes. Okay, and to your knowledge, did she always maintain that any physical injuries she had had come from J.C. Penney's security guards? Yes. Did she ever tell you that wasn't true? No, she did not. 
Did you ever learn at some point that wasn't true? Objection. Foundation. Hearsay. Sustained. Do you recall in that deposition Janet Arvizo saying that she was fondled approximately 25 times by J.C. Penney's security guards on that particular day? Objection. Hearsay. Relevance and court's order. Overruled. You may answer. Yes, I recall that. And had she ever told you that before? She had not. Was that the first time you ever heard Janet tell that story? It was. How many times do you think you had met her? Excuse me, let me rephrase that. How many times do you think you had discussed these alleged events with Janet before that deposition? No less than 25. I talked to her quite often. And you're saying that in those approximately 25 discussions, she never told you about her being fondled 25 times by J.C. Penney security guards? Objection. Asked and answered. Argumentative. Asked and answered. Sustained. Were you surprised when she said that under oath? Yes. Do you recall ever learning about a fundraiser for Gavin Arvizo? Yes. How did you learn about that fundraiser? I believe all of my recollection is that Janet informed me that there was some sort of fundraiser going on to raise funds for Gavin's medical treatment and living expenses. Were you invited to the fundraiser? No, I don't recall it being a formal fundraiser. I thought it was just sort of a solicitation of money. Did she ask you for money directly? She did. Did you give her any money? I did not. I have no further questions. Cross-examine? No questions, Your Honor. Thank you. You may step down. Call your next witness. Yes, Your Honor. The defense will call Miss Karen Brando. Come forward. When you get to the witness stand, please remain standing. Face the clerk here and raise your right hand. Yes. Please be seated. State and spell your name for the record. My name is Karen Brando. K-A-R-E-N-B-R-A-N-D-O. Thank you. Good morning, Mrs. Brando. Good morning. Mrs. Brando. Your mic. Oh, okay. Pardon me. Mrs. Brando, are you related to Marlon Brando? Yes. How so? Daughter-in-law. Okay. And do you have any children? Yes. And who are they? Faustif, Franco, Shane, Nelson and Prudence. And have you ever been to Neverland Ranch? Yes. How many times do you think you've been there? Several. Maybe 10, 15. Do you know the fellow seated at council table on my right? Yes. And who is he? Michael Jackson. Is he a friend of yours? Yes. Did you ever meet a person named Janet Arvizo? Yes. Do you know approximately when you met Janet Arvizo? It was a couple years ago at the ranch. And were you staying at the ranch? Yes. To your knowledge, was Janet staying at the ranch? Yes. And do you recall where you met Janet Arvizo at the ranch? In the kitchen. And what do you recall her doing in the kitchen? She came up to me and told me she was going home with me. She told you she was going home with you? Yes. Is this the first time you ever spoke to her? Yes. Were you surprised by that comment? No, because I was going with the driver. How long had you been at the ranch at that point? Two days. And were your children there as well? Yes. Who of your children were at the ranch? Prudence was there. And I'm not sure if Shane was there. Okay, now, how old was Prudence at that point? Seven. And how about Shane? Fourteen. Okay, and had you arranged or had someone arranged for a driver to take you home? Yes. And how was that arranged, if you remember? My husband Miko came up to me and told me that he was going to stay and that Gary would drive me home. Okay, was your husband Miko at the ranch at that point? Yes. Okay, this wasn't the first time you'd visited Neverland, right? No. You'd been there many times before this? Yes. So what were you doing in the kitchen when Janet Arvizo came up to you? I was standing, I was just standing there.
I was standing kind of in the hallway right between the kitchen and the breakfast nook. And do you know about what time of day this was? It was early evening, around six o'clock. And do you recall the date being March 12, 2003? I don't remember. Okay. Do you recall if it was March of 2003? Don't know? I'm sorry. Okay. All right. So Janet Arviso came up to you and said, I'm going home with you. Yes. And had you met her any other time before that? No. Did she introduce herself? No. What did you say when she, when this stranger walked up and said, I'm going home with you? I didn't say anything to her. I couldn't. I wasn't driving. Did you and she have a conversation? No. How long did she talk to you about going home? She just told me she was going home with me. And after she said that, what do you recall her doing? She just walked off. And what did you do after that? I went to Miko and told him I didn't want her going home with me. But he said, it's okay. Just make sure she gets dropped off at her house first so she doesn't know where we live. And did you go home that evening? Yes. Did she go with you? No, she came up to me about an hour later and said she changed her mind, she was going to stay. Did you say anything to her in response to her statement? Nothing. Can you describe Janet Arviso's demeanor when you first met her? I watched her in the kitchen and she was very abrupt. She was very hyper, demanding. Someone that you don't trust. Your Honor, I'm going to object to the last. Stricken. Move to strike. It's stricken. Did she demand anything of you? Just to go home with me. Okay. How much time elapsed, if you remember, between the time she came up to you and said, I'm going home with you, and when she came up to you and said, I've changed my mind. I'm staying. About an hour. Okay. Can you describe her demeanor when she came up to you and said she was going to stay? Calmer. She was calmer than she was earlier. Earlier it was like she was frantic. Did you ever see her after that, that moment? No. Ever talk to her after that moment? No. No further questions. No questions. All right. Thank you. You may step down. We'll call Prudence Brando. Please remain standing. Look over here and raise your right hand. Face the clerk. Yeah. All right. You may be seated. Please be seated. State and spell your name for the record. P-R-U-D-E-N-C-E. -E. Okay. Last name okay? That's fine. All right. Okay. Prudence. Hello. I'm going to ask you some questions, okay? Nods head up and down. Now, we need you to talk right into that microphone on the right. Right there. The one you're right in front of. Good. How old are you? Nine. Okay. And you go to school? Yeah. Okay. What grade are you in? Fourth. Fourth grade? Nods head up and down. Do you like it? Yeah. Okay. Who's your dad? Miko. And who's your mom? Karen. Okay. Did your mom just come into court here? Yeah. All right. Now, do you remember spending some time at Neverland Ranch? Yes. Okay. How often do you go there? A lot. Okay. Do you know the gentleman seated right here? Yes. And who's that? Michael. Okay. Is he a friend of yours? Yes. All right. When you were at Neverland Ranch, do you recall some kids whose last name was Arviso? Yeah. Do you remember their first names? Yeah. What are their first names? Star and Gavin. All right. And did you see them around the ranch while you were there? Yes. Can you tell me what you remember them doing around the ranch? Driving the golf carts and going on rides. Okay. How were they at driving the golf carts? What did they do with the golf carts? They were crashing them. Now, you say, crashing them. Was it like by mistake, or what did you think they were doing? I think on purpose, because they were driving all crazy and going. They were just driving crazy. Okay. Did they ever say anything to you when they were driving the golf carts and they were? Let me ask you this. 
Did you ever see them crash the golf carts? A couple of times. And what did they crash into? Do you remember? Like when they turned, they would, like, skin the side of it. Okay. Do you know if the Arviso kids, Star and Gavin, would hang out around the zoo sometimes? Yes, they would. And were they good to the animals at the zoo? Yeah. They were okay? Did you see them at the theater? Yeah. What would you see them doing at the theater? They would be watching movies and stuff. And did they get stuff while they were at the theater? Yes. What would they get? Like candy, popcorn. Okay. And that was there for people to have, right? Yes. Okay. Did they go on the rides at the amusement park? Yeah. What would you see them doing on the rides? Throwing candy off the rides. Okay. Would they throw it at people? No. Do you know? When they were at the theater, do you remember them doing anything with the candy and popcorn while they were at the theater besides eating it? No. Do you remember if they'd throw it or anything? Your Honor, I'm going to object as leading. He answered the question. It's asked and answered. Sustained. I will allow some leading. That is an asked and answered question. So. Okay. Very well. Do you recall the Arviso kids, Star and Gavin, doing anything with the telephones that are in the theater? No. Don't recall? Okay. Now, when you saw them doing stuff they weren't supposed to do, did you ever tell them to knock it off? Your Honor, I'm going to object to that question, the use of the words, they weren't supposed to do. Sustained. It's editorial. Did you ever see Star and Gavin doing anything they weren't supposed to do? Sometimes. Did you ever talk to them about that? Did you ever say anything to them? No. Do you recall talking to Mr. Jackson at any time, to Michael? Did you ever tell Michael the kids were doing something? No, I just hang out with him sometimes, but... Okay, do you recall Develin Arviso? Do you know who she is? Yeah. Okay, and is that the sister of Star and Gavin? Yeah. Do you recall? Do you recall if Develin used to tell Star and Gavin to stop doing things? I don't think so, no. You don't recall? Okay, okay. And then have you been in Michael's private room in his house? Yeah. And you know Prince and Paris, right? Yeah. Who are Prince and Paris? His kids. Michael's kids? Yeah. Okay. Have you gone in there with Prince and Paris? Yeah. And what do you do when you go into his room? He just showed us around his room. Did you watch TV in there? Yeah, for a couple minutes. Okay. All right. I have no further questions. No questions. All right, thank you. You may step down. May I have just a moment to see who's? You may. We'll call Philip Esplin to the stand. When you get to the witness stand, please remain standing. Face the clerk over here. Raise your right hand. I do. Please be seated. State and spell your name for the record. My name is Philip W. Esplin. E-S-P-L-I-N. Thank you. May I proceed, Your Honor? Yes, you may. Okay, Dr. Esplin, what is your profession? I'm a forensic psychologist. All right, I'm going to ask you to move that right microphone up a little higher. Just bring it up higher, like that, and try to talk into the right microphone, if you can. All right, a forensic psychologist? That's correct. And what does a forensic psychologist do? It's a psychologist that tends to focus on psychological or social science issues that are related to various judicial proceedings. It could be a dependency matter, a juvenile court. It could be a competency to stand trial. It could be study relative to children and witnesses, things of that nature. Okay, and where do you practice? Where is your office right now? Phoenix, Arizona. All right, now. I'd like you to go back and give us a brief description of your educational background starting with college. I have a bachelor's degree obtained in 1967. I then spent three years in the United States Marine Corps. When I was released from active duty, I went back to graduate school, obtained my master's degree in 1973. I continued on with my doctoral studies, finished my doctoral dissertation in late summer of 1978, 
I took the national examination, psychology, in the fall of 1978, was licensed by the Arizona Board of Psychologist Examiners in November of 1978, and I've been licensed since that time. I did an internship in child psychology in Tempe, Arizona, in 1974-75. All right, let me go back. What is your bachelor's degree in? What subject? Sociology was my major. Psychology was my minor. And your master's degree is in what subject? Psychology. And your PhD? Psychology. Now, is that clinical psychology or? No, I came from a psychoeducational background, and my interest and dissertation had to do with studying brain injured children that may have had an injury, an acute injury or an injury secondary to a congenital condition. So I was interested in how children learn, how children, to help them remember things that they learn. All right, and since 1974 and 19, I'm sorry, 1975, when you concluded your internship, how have you been engaged? My career's been divided into two parts. From beginning roughly 1976 until 1988, I worked predominantly in a clinical area. I worked with a hospital system where I had some responsibilities for a child program, inpatient program, and adolescent program. I also assessed and treated children that had been removed from their homes by the state for either sexual maltreatment, neglect or physical maltreatment. I also, during that period of time, worked extensively with the courts in Arizona relative to evaluating children and families that were going through a divorce. In 1988, I began my relationship with the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development in Washington, D.C. They began what's called the Child Witness Project, Research Project, which began the, the planning began in 1988. We began the first field study in 1989, and that series of studies involves children ages 3 through 14 who may have been the victim of a crime or a witness to a crime. And I've participated as part of that team effort to try to understand how children go about accommodating adversity in an environment, how their memories operate, whether there's age effects of memory, and how can we develop procedures that will increase the accuracy of information that we can obtain from children during the course of an investigation. All right, so let's go back over this in just a little more detail. From 19, in 1974 and, 75, when you did your internship, did that involve children? Yes. And how did that involve children? I was involved in a re- my internship was under the auspices of a federal demonstration project that was attempting to develop what's called engineered classrooms for mentally challenged children, for brain-injured children, for deaf children, and for children that were designated as severely emotionally disturbed. Okay, now, in part, your graduate education related to brain-injured children, is that right? Well, I, my independent research, my dissertation, I was interested in developing a method for examining sensory suppression effects and if there's hemispheric damage. Once I got out and started practice, that got left, frankly, by the wayside. So after the internship, is it correct to say that you began to work more with children who were maltreated, or at least that became a, allegedly maltreated or actually maltreated, that became a predominant part of your practice? Yes, there was, I was the clinical director of a day treatment program that was run by the state of Arizona. That program had 150 families in the program. Those children had been removed from their home and placed in a psychiatric facility. And the objective of the program was, where feasible, to return them home, or in the alternative, to consider parental termination and placement in a long-term either adoptive home or a, what was called then a therapeutic foster home. The majority of those children had been maltreated in some capacity. And this would have been during your experience from 1976 to 1988? That's correct. All right, so at that point you began to have, Go ahead and take your time. Get some water there first. Excuse me, I've got a little bit of a cold. Okay, at that point, you began to have fairly regular contact with children who either were or claimed to have been sexually abused, is that correct? That's correct. Now, you mentioned in the course of this, that, oh, thank you. You mentioned in the course of this that the, some of the children were involved in legal proceedings, or maybe all of them. They all were involved in one way or another with legal proceedings. All right, and so the court was supervising what happened with these children pending a placement or some other resolution of their situation, is that right? Correct. Now, in 1988, you talked about the National Institute of Child Health. Can you describe that in a little more detail? What is the National Institute of Child Health? I think there's more to the name than that, but... Well, there's National Institutes of Health. 
That's a government-sponsored series of research institutes. There's the Center for Medicine, the Center for Cancer, the Center for Retardation. Within it, the National Institute of Health, there's a section called the Section on Children's Social and Emotional Development within the Institute on Child Health and Human Development. All right. So it was within that section that the Child Witness Project was funded. All right. So you were working within that section on a Child Witness Project? That's correct. And what specifically was the mission of this particular funded section? I had presented a pilot study at a NATO conference in 1988 in Italy in which I had compared two groups of children, one group in which we felt we had strong independent evidence that they had been sexually abused, a second group in which we felt that there was substantial indication they had not been abused. And I was interested in seeing to what degree could you develop information that would help you categorize those two groups. That field study then led to me going back, spending a couple of days with Dr. Lamb and his colleagues at NICHD, and out of that then came the Child Witness Project. What our mission has been is to work. We conduct what's called field studies, and that's a little different than laboratory studies. Laboratory studies occur when you can control all the conditions in the laboratory. So you subject a child to certain experiences. You videotape it. You then can question them in various ways and you can measure precisely the accuracy that may come from different types of questions and so on. Let me interrupt you right there. That type of laboratory experiment does not lend itself to sexual abuse experimentation, is that correct? Well, it's, it's very important work to establish theoretical principles about how memory operates. But you cannot recreate the circumstance in a laboratory that may exist for a child who has been subjected to sexual maltreatment. So the laboratory studies, in and of themselves, are insufficient. So it requires taking those principles in the laboratory about memory, motivation, how to question witnesses, and then apply it in field studies in which there are live investigations of potential crimes against children, and see how that data converges. The degree to which the principles in the laboratory you can replicate in the field, the more confidence you can have that your methods are sound. Now, in addition to the laboratory studies, you mentioned, then, the field studies. Can you describe the field studies? Those are studies that are conducted in cooperation with law enforcement and or child protective services. So we would go to a site, and we would spend X number of years there. We would be training the sex crime investigators in interviewing procedures. We work with them on trying to collect corroborating evidence, and we then measure how well that interview and investigative protocol works compared to whatever they were doing before we began our research. So we've been, we just finished up a five-year project with the Salt Lake Police Department and the Utah Sheriff's Department or Salt Lake County Sheriff's Department. We've been in Israel nationally since 1990. We had a five-year project with the West Palm Beach Sheriff's Department and with the Marion County Sheriff's Department. We have an ongoing project with the Children's Justice Center in Salt Lake, which is an advocacy center in which children are questioned and it's videotaped. And they are implementing our procedures there at that site. Now, is it the object of these projects that you are conducting with law enforcement, both internationally and throughout the country as you described, is it the object to develop techniques to try to avoid false claims? Well, it's, the answer is yes. It's intended to try and develop methods that maximize the opportunity of, number one, obtaining accurate information. And number two, probably motivating the child to try to be accurate, because you have problems. You have some children that deny because the event did not occur. You have some children deny, which is a false denial, for whatever motives they may have for withholding the information. So you have kind of a two-pronged problem. The other difficulty is, in the majority of these kinds of cases, Oftentimes it's the word of the child against the word of the defendant, and oftentimes there isn't the kind of corroborative evidence that would be nice to have. Consequently, the child becomes a central player in the process. So it's, our efforts have been geared to trying to adopt strategies that will maximize accurate information from the children and then also understand dynamics that occur when a child, for whatever motive, may not be forthright with you. And in that regard, I asked about one side of it, you are looking to see if you can develop techniques that will maximize the ability to get the truth, is that right? Get to the truth in your investigation? To get accurate, forthright information. So that could go either way. You've got children who are denying when something did happen. And you've got children saying things happened when they didn't happen, is that correct? That's correct. All right, now, it sounds like your involvement with the National Institute of Child Health has continued from 1988 to the present. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. In addition to that, have you continued on in working with children in other respects? Yes, I have. 
and what regard is that? I evaluate children who have been, in civil matters, who have been the victim of abuse, relative to treatment needs, short and long term. I consult with institutions that provide care to children so that their environment lessens the opportunity for a child to be exploited at the hands of an adult. And I also continue to look at cases that are unusual and do retrospective analysis where we know what the ground truth is. So I also will do some training. I do some instruction about children's competency, factors that can affect their competence. All right. Now, you mentioned, just to clear up a couple things, you mentioned you're licensed as a psychologist in the state of Arizona. And that license you obtained in 1978, is that correct? Yes. And you have been continuously licensed and in good standing there? That's correct. All right. Now, are you licensed in the state of California? No, I am not. So you would not be permitted to practice clinical psychology and see patients without going to open, or going to, I'm sorry, would not be able to open an office for doing that in California without getting a license? Well, most states have a guest provision, so I could come in the state of California to do an assessment, something of that nature, so many days a year, just like a California psychologist could come into Arizona, if there's provision. If I was going to move here and set up a practice, I would need to get a license through the California board. All right, and you do not, at this time, you haven't moved here. You don't intend to practice here? There's too many people. And evidently the dry air is better for your respiratory system. The, now, is there anything that prevents you from offering, either ethically, professionally or license-wise, from offering your forensic services and your opinions in courts in states within which you do not have a license? No. All right, now, you have, in addition to the educational background and history you gave us, so on, you have written a number of articles, is that correct? Yes. And are a number of these articles. Let me ask you this. Do you know how many articles you've written on the issue of child psychology in general? I believe there's 25 articles on child witnesses that have been published in peer-reviewed journals. Okay. I think there's eight book chapters. Okay. So the 25 articles in peer-reviewed journals, can you tell us what that means? What is a peer-reviewed journal? That would. It refers to a professional journal in which, when you submit the article, the article is blindly reviewed by other experts in the field, who make editorial comments, recommend either acceptance or rejection of the article, and provide you feedback if they feel that the article needs to be modified, rewritten, for, you know, if it's not clear, whether there's confusing areas. So it's an attempt to increase the quality of scientific publications. So most scientific journals are what they call peer-reviewed journals. And that would be true for, say, physicists who are publishing articles in their peer-reviewed journals as well. That's correct. That would be in contrast, say, if I wrote an article for Newsweek magazine, it wouldn't be peer-reviewed. All right, so in these peer-reviewed journals, how recently is your most recent publication? I have a publication that was accepted December of, 04 in the, I believe it was the Journal of Developmental Sciences. And you have published articles, without going into each one, but you've published articles pretty much each year over the last. I believe the first. 10 years or so? Well, the first article was 1991, and I believe I've published pretty much annually since that time. Have you published in the Developmental Review? Yes. And who is the, what organization sponsors that review? APA, American Psychological Association, I believe. All right, and you've published in the Journal of Consulting and Clinical Psychology, is that correct? Correct. Applied Developmental Science? Correct. A publication called Child Development? Correct. A publication called Child Abuse and Neglect? Correct. A publication called Legal and Criminological Psychology? Correct. Another one called Family and Conciliation Courts Review? Correct. Another one called Learning and Individual Differences? Correct. International Journal of Behavioral Development? Correct. Psychology? Public Policy and the Law? Well, that's a law review journal published jointly by the University of Miami and the University of Arizona Law School. But I have published in that law review journal. All right, and then do you recall the books to which you contributed chapters? First chapter was in a book put out by the APA, the American Psychological Association, called The Suggestibility of Children's Recollections. Actually, the first one was a book put out by NATO called Credibility Assessment. 
Then there was a chapter in a book on, a forensic handbook. I'd have to look. I don't. We don't have to go over all of them, but these are. These are books that are respected in the field of psychology, for the most part. They're books that are sponsored by the Office of Scientific Affairs for the American Psychological Association. All right. I believe all but one. And in order to be asked to write a chapter for that, you have to be accepted among your peers as to somebody who's qualified to write such a chapter. Whoever is editing the book has got to believe you have something to contribute to the book. All right. Now, have you also given seminars? Do you speak at seminars from time to time? Yes, I do. All right. And do you speak on the issue of child witnesses and the general subject matter you've been talking about? Yes. And when I said seminars, that would include also presenting scientific papers at symposiums. Correct. Okay. Now. Do you want to take the break? I was just going to get to the next big subject. So that would be fine. Thank you.